Okay, hello, welcome back. Let's see how long my throat lasts for this session. I again apologize for um, the quality of my voice today. Um, so we had this uh, discussion of numerous front ends for general C computation. And um, before going back to some deep questions uh, about backends and the, their interaction with front ends and how to solve uh, the scalability issue even better. Sorry, and how to solve this scalability issue even better. Let me uh, describe a particular application um, that I think is uh, a poster boy for uh, zero knowledge snarks. It's a case where all the different properties come together in harmony to build a useful system. And this is uh, zero cache, the joint work with Elidin Sasson. Uh, Alessandro Chiesa, Christina Garman, Matt Green, Ian Mears, uh, and Mandark Spirza, and uh, everything that I'll describe, uh, I'll describe now uh, you can see, including the, the source code at uh, this website. So let's start with some motivation, setting up the stage. After all, this will be a particular application. So we're going to go outside the realm of snarks to the real world where everybody uses Bitcoin. And um, Bitcoin is a wonderful decentralized digital currency, and digital means that possession of coins is represented as knowledge of strings. And payment of a coin is represented as passing a string to, say, a merchant. And once a consumer pays a merchant and gets merchandise, there is a slight issue. The consumer could go to another merchant and present the same string to get more merchandise and so on. This is called the double spending problem. And this is the basic issue that uh, uh, makes uh, electronic cash so difficult, so much harder than uh, just using digital signatures. And the way uh, Satoshi Nakamoto dealt with this is by having a blockchain, which contains a broadcast of every transaction. So uh, every time someone pays someone else some amount, there is a record of that. And if someone tries to uh, use the same coin, it will be detected as a duplicate. That kind of works. Um, there are no serious attacks on this uh, a basic protocol. The, uh, all of the attacks that we hear about, or the, at least theoretical ones, are a, on the um, underlying protocol that maintains the blockchain. But already here you can see that there is a grave issue, and that is privacy. Because all of that blockchain is there for everyone to see. Everyone can see uh, what merchant you pay, how much and when. One merchant can spy on another. Um, cash flow and account balances are publicly visible. And um, that works to show that despite the use of pseudonyms in Bitcoin, the transaction graph can still be analyzed. It's also uh, for those of you uh, in the, uh, um, that hang around in the Bitcoin community, you may be aware of the fungibility issues, which is a basic property of currency, with, uh, meaning that one dollar equals another dollar regardless of its history. Whereas, um, because coins carry their history around, recorded in the blockchain, it's too tempting for someone to say that they will not respect the customer's money because they come from the wrong country, or dealt with the wrong people, or hold the wrong views. And that means that the value of the currency becomes unclear, therefore uh, um, devaluing it. So zero cash is a system that solves this problem. It's a privacy preserving protocol for digital currency. It's similar to and sits on top of uh, Bitcoin or is a version of Bitcoin uh, or other similar currencies that are based on currencies. A particular implementation is for Bitcoin. And the end result is that for someone who looks at the blockchain, all they'll see is a bunch of random looking values and zero knowledge proofs. So no information is leaked. And yet, uh, people can naturally pay each other. They can pay uh, in, in, with variable <coughs> denominations. That's a technically non trivial property not provided by uh, other related constructions. But this amount or the source of destinations, none of these are revealed to anyone except for the participants in the transaction. Um, we're going to end up with proofs that have 288 bits, sorry, 
288 bytes long, and you can guess where that comes from. Um, and they will be easy to verify a few milliseconds. Again, you can guess where that comes from. They will take a whole minute to create. Unfortunately, this comes from the same place, the use of a snark. And there will also be some system parameters, uh, OK, proving a verification key for the underlying snark uh, that will be about a gigabyte in size, annoying but quite manageable. The blockchain is bigger anyway. There will be trust and generation needed, again, because of the underlying snark. And there will be also the corresponding assumptions, in particular, a knowledge of exponent. And the way this works, as should be no surprise by now, is by treating things as computation and plugging them into snarks. Let's just do the mental mapping using the same illustration as we started with uh, in my uh, snark, snark backend session. So we have a consumer that wants to pay some amount of bitcoins to a merchant. And uh, they know in their mind that they got the money from someone else <laughs> and the transaction was correct according to the protocol and they hadn't spent it so far. They have their own financial books, but they're not going to send them. That will violate the privacy. So instead, they take the computation that the merchant would have performed had he received the, the, uh, all of that financial information. They consider it as a function to compute, and they compute it in their mind. It's as if there was the, there were a, a virtual accountant uh, sending next to their desk as they uh, use coins from the wallet. Uh, but instead of sending a digital signature, they're acquiring trust in, in that accountant. They would just run the computation by themselves and produce a, crew, a proof. And uh, this falls into a general paradigm. And you can see that we want soundness for the proof, we have, or at least an argument. We want this to be non-interactive. And that's crucial, because we're going to put things in the blockchain. So we can be interactive at all, not even too long interaction. That's too much. We can have some setup once and for all for the system, but then proofs will be a string that can be put in the blockchain. We want it to be a proof of knowledge, um, and that's because we'll end up proving things about statements that do have crypto in them, and uh, things like signatures, and of course, um, um, just proving that a signature verifier accepts. There exists a signature such that a verifier accepts. That's not enough. Of course, there exists a signature. You need to prove that you receive the signature. You know a signature that requires the proof of knowledge property. The proof will be succinct, both in terms of the proof size, so the blockchain is, is, doesn't blow up too much, and because everybody's going to verify them, we want quick verification. Overall, we need a snark, and to protect privacy, we want it to be zero knowledge. So every single property that we stated in advance is relied upon in this system. Question? Um, the blockchain itself will not be part of the statement that is, that is being proved. That, of course, would make it too large. Um, there will be some summary of the blockchain, as we'll see, a root of a Merkle tree for the blockchain, essentially. It will come in a minute. OK, yeah. The problem is that uh, people will care about the validity of payments even when you are offline. You are not even there to interact. You, you pay the merchant, then the merchant uh, makes a payment to the bank. The bank wants to know that the merchant uh, holds legit money. If that relies on the merchant interacting with you, the bank is not convinced. And the bank cannot come to you and ask you about that transaction because you may be on vacation. So this will work for the first hop, but then the merchant will be stuck with money that he cannot spend because no one else will be convinced. Okay. So interactive proofs are not transferable. OK, so uh, let's fix the choice of snark just to be concrete. And we're going to use the one that we've been discussing most of the time, 
uh, the uh, GGPR a line of SNARKs with the PGHR and um, BCTV14 Usenix improvements, um, in concretely the deep SNARK implementation. So that fixes the back end. And uh, yeah. Yes, yes. So uh, that takes care of the back end. We're not going to say any more about it. And uh, now there's a question of the front end. What do we plug in? Um, and uh, we need to build uh, the function f and express it. Uh, let me tell you that we built it uh, as our one CS using the uh, gadget library that I told you about. And not say anything about an implementation either. Um, but let's see what the statement is. And this will be amusing because it will exercise the, our, our power of non-determinism and choices and uh, show the stress between things that you, that you uh, do within the snark statement and things that you do outside the snark statement without the snark overhead. Um, so consider this a study case. So this is a property that we won't discuss, but actually, yes, there, would, there is some secret randomness that you use when you created a transaction, and you can reveal it. Uh, okay, so, uh, we, so we're going to uh, describe zero cache in a sequence of, uh, of steps. Uh, will, we will stop somewhere before the full construction, but let's start to get the flavor. And uh, you can think of, we start with some toy examples of build up. So uh, you can think about um, a, a coin of zero cash, a unit of denomination held by someone, um, as re represented by a bunch of values. Some of these are uh, private and known only to the holder, and some are public in the ledger. So uh, the simplest scheme would require a serial number, and uh, a, everyone uh, can create a coin under some conditions, for example, by proving that they uh, deposited some amount of bitcoins or dollars or whatever, and uh, they produce proof that they, say, deposited gold bars, and uh, then they get to announce that they created uh, a bitcoin with the, and uh, designated by a serial number. All of these serial numbers are posted, and then uh, to spend the coin, uh, you say, okay, I'm using up the, the coin with the given serial number. Uh, of course, that's not a good idea because um, um, everybody else knows that serial number and everybody else can use your coin. There's nothing private to know. Everything is in the ledger. There has to be something private. And the way around this goes back to a paper of uh, Sander and Tashma uh, that proposed to use a commitment scheme. When you um, create a coin, uh, you pick the serial number, keep it to yourself, and um, then you commit to it with some uh, commitment randomness using a hanging and binding commitment function to uh, derive a commitment value. And all of these commitments are posted. And then to spend the coin, you say, OK, I'm using a coin with the given commitment value. You can check that it's posted in the blockchain. And to prove that I own it, I will show you the corresponding serial number in R. My knowledge of R and the serial number, uh, the inputs on the commitment, protects others from using that. Whereas the, uh, the binding property of the commitment uh, ensures that uh, I, I can come up only with a unique serial number. And that means that if I try to use the same the commitment multiple times, people will detect the duplicate use of the serial number. That, right, that, and this avoids double spending. The problem with this toy version is that it doesn't provide privacy. Because people can connect the time when you've created the commitment and say, I hereby add CM6 to the blockchain to the time when you decommit to the value CM6. So there's no privacy there, and we really want to do something better. And what we'll do is the following. First, we'll summarize 
the, uh, the blockchain, in, uh, in this case, the list of commitments into a Merkle tree. This is something everyone can do. It's completely public. And uh, the root of the Merkle tree is a succinct summary of all the comments that were minted so far. And now, whenever I want to spend a coin, I, I, I announce the following, or at least give the following to the relevant merchant. I said that I'm using a coin. Here is its serial number, so people can check that it's not double spent. And moreover, I know the corresponding decommitment randomness R, and I know the corresponding commitment value. And that commitment value is in the Merkle tree of all commitments, expressed as I know a path in the Merkle tree leading from the root to, uh, to that commitment, a path in that sense. Now, I could prove this just by revealing all of those values, the commitment randomness, commitment, and path, that would violate my privacy. Instead, I prove this using a snark. I plug this statement into... Uh, into a snark uh, where the computation fixes the serial number and fixes the, check, the checks that are written here, but it leaves as witness, as non-deterministic advice, the, um, the secret values, which are the path, the commitment, and uh, the R. And so um, Zero knowledge protects my privacy, whereas soundness or more precisely proof of knowledge ensure that this stays convincing. Make sense? Questions? This is the, the, the first time we exercise snugs in the construction, and we'll be developing this. So if anything isn't clear, now is a good time to ask. Yes? So double spending is prevented by uh, the serial number being exposed in the clear. Any attempt to uh, spend the coin again will, co will cause the same SN to happen again. That will be detected. And all the transactions have the same value? Uh, so far, they have the same value, yes. So um, let's see what properties do we need. Let's play the game again. We need it to be a proof or at least an argument. We need it to be non-interactive so we can post it on the blockchain. We need it to be zero knowledge for privacy. We need to be proof of knowledge because we are going to say things about commitment. And at least if the commitment is only computationally binding, then um, it must be, uh, then the merchant will only be convinced by a snark proof if he believes that the, the customer knows the commitment randomness rather than there exists. And it needs to be succinct. OK, we have these. What a coincidence. But now that we have these, now that we are using snarks for NP, then actually, why stop here? Well, because it's hard to talk. Um, <laughs> well, why stop here in terms of the uh, functionality that we implement where we have the full power of NP at our disposal? And that's indeed where we can get extra features. For example, uh, we can add uh, coins with vari variable amount, uh, variable denomination. One such structure can represent uh, a, 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 a currency with a value of $10, with, while another would be 17 And there was no place to put it there before, but we can actually add that. Um, to, the, uh, uh, to the values that are known to the various parties. The way we do this is by actually having two commitments, an inner one and an outer one. There is a value and uh, added uh, to the outer one. And now minting um, creates a new commitment and actually exposes the outer stuff, including the value, to make sure that the newly minted coin is the right value, the same as the gold bar that allowed us to mint the coin. Whereas um, spending um, will be by proving that uh, we know all of the commitment randomness, and, uh, and that allows verifying the, uh, the commitment. So we plug in a different state in to the snark, and we also change the protocol around it to deal with extra values. Um, staying with uh, the protocol outside it, just going back to the question, uh, note how the Merkle tree 
uh, summarize the whole blockchain, and this is what allows that allowed us to keep the snark reasonably small, despite the blockchain being five gigabytes inside nowadays. Now we can have extra features like being able to uh, create a coin address to someone in particular. We can add a private and public keys for everyone, and uh, a private key would allow them to receive payments. A public key can be used to send them payments. And then um, we can actually create a new coin that only someone in particular can use up. And we use the, to do this by adding more stuff and uh, some uh, uh, extra crypto in the, in the structure that uh, incorporates the, pri the public key and the secret key. And then the mint key will do that, and the spending will do that. And we also have a, a sending protocol that sends the recommended, recommended stuff. We will not go into these details, and even these are simplified. But at the end of the day, all of this and the, in its full generality can be encapsulated by a single type of transaction that provides everything we want. Sending payments, uh, making change, uh, converting one coin into several smaller coins that sum up to the same thing, uh, exchanging stuff into big coins that is minting, paying transaction fees, etc. And um, this single transaction, uh, this is a logical object uh, that we want to, to happen, uh, and, and we'll see how it's implemented. Um, so this, uh, it, this uh, transaction uh, consumes old zero-cash coins and creates new zero-cash coins. It can also um, uh, create public coins that are not secret, and uh, it gets some instructions, what values uh, it should be for the new coins, and who to send them to, how much to make public. And um, it uh, outputs stuff that we should put on the blockchain. The serial numbers of the old coins that are hereby burnt, nobody will ever be able to use them up because the serial numbers already appear on the blockchain. The commitments to the new coins that will be used in future proofs. And Zero knowledge proof. Zero knowledge proof for the statement that we built up carefully that uh, at high level says that the old coins were valid according to the checks we showed earlier, and moreover, the total value of the new coins equals the total value of the old coins. We round down the statement, and then we, that, we plug it as an R1CS into the backend prover. And uh, that's executed inside the pool procedure in order to produce the requisite record in the blockchain that is considered an execution of this transaction. Uh, this is what it looks like at the end of the day. So you can verify that it's sufficiently small to be on the slide. Um, and uh, what we have here uh, is all these instructions, uh, at least the public part of them some stuff we didn't go into, and the zero knowledge proof. Overall, less than a kilobyte. All of this is implemented by uh, some algorithms. So we define formally the notion of decentralized anonymous payment scheme as a crypto primitive. And it has algorithms for doing the natural operations, including the pool operation and the verified transaction operation. These, these invoke the stock prover and verify internally, respectively. And there are security definitions saying that uh, no information is leaked by an adver uh, uh, to an adversary, even, even if the adversary can affect what transactions are performed. He doesn't learn anything he didn't know anyway. Uh, money can't be faked. And uh, transactions cannot be uh, manipulated as they make their way to the ledger. Um, so uh, we also have the non malleability and that accounts for some of the details I glossed over earlier. Um, so this is a non-trivial system. It uh, starts with uh, Lib Snark from Skipper Lab uh, and a bunch of code from, uh, a, a, from a Bitcoin and some glue code. And then uh, we have some, we have a handcrafted statement uh, expresses I1CS. Uh, and that's wrapped in a, in a code called uh, Lead Zero Cash, another open source project that you can find on GitHub. Um, and that's integrated into the Bitcoin daemon software that um, it implements the uh, network protocol. 
and to be make sure that it works fast enough to keep up with the, the Bitcoin uh, um, network and transaction rate, we actually emulated it uh, on the almost full Bitcoin scale on Amazon EC2, and it keeps up. Uh, unlike, by the way, some prior transactions, which uh, were uh, both, uh, both uh, slower and, and, and uh, provided less functionality because they did not have full NP statement snarks at their disposal. And the performance I mentioned earlier, um, the bottom line is that these are realistic parameters. There is the matter of setup, and um, the setup algorithm of the, uh, of the or cache requires the, generates the keys that are used by everyone. If it's compromised, some of this goes away, money can be faked. Privacy stays there, because if you remember how we achieved privacy in the QAPs, it was just making things completely random. So privacy is unconditional, statistical, uh, statistical uh, privacy, statistical zero knowledge, um, but faking money is kind of a problem. Fortunately, we have only have to do it once. Um, and um, it can even be done by a multi-party computation protocol. So there's another work, uh, I probably have to cut it from uh, in this subsequent discussion, so let me mention it here. This issue of trust is, uh, is a very important one. Um, for many applications, so we set up to understand how to do the trusted setup if we're stuck with it, uh, and at least reduce the trust assumption by having a, a multi-party computation involving many parties, with the property that uh, it would require corrupting all of them to, um, uh, to violate the soundness. So if, if specifically for zero cash, you would put together uh, a committee of 20 people um, uh, such that Anyone, regardless of his political inclinations, would trust at least one of them or some of them. And uh, if they uh, do this kind of multi-party computation that we prescribe in this paper, the result is a proving key and verification key that can be used for zero cash. And from then they're on your set, commerce is secure forever, or at least until uh, someone breaks down the line crypt. So, um, open problems. Um, So um, one is, uh, how can you get more power from uh, the NP, expressive power of the snark? And in particular, what do we do about the people who correctly point out that uh, anonymity has its downsides and can be uh, used in the service of terrorists? And uh, insert your favorite political motivation. So um, um, well, Maybe things are too strong, maybe they should be weakened, but how do we know what to weaken them into and how to uh, express some extra policies in a way that will make policy makers and the public happy? Um, well, we can do a lot with, uh, with NP statements. Uh, for example, we can uh, have the SNARKs prove that, yes, I'm using a coin with a given value and serial number and commitment randomness and public key, secret keys. Oh, and also, I pay the 10% tax on this transaction to uh, some designated um, payment address. And also, uh, I won't tell you how much the transaction is worth, but if it's over $1,000, then uh, he, he, I also have a signature from an authorized uh, notary that I put my name with escrow so you can trace the transaction in the matter if it comes up in a criminal investigation, and so on. It's a huge space. Uh, I pose it as an open problem to find useful th and practical things to do in this space. Another question is that of performance and overhead of proving. A minute, well, let me be frank. The only reason a minute is acceptable is that the Bitcoin blockchain rate is 10 minutes. Once Bitcoin uh, solves this and there are many proposals and uh, gets transactions with lower latency, and a minute here will be uh, a significant uh, degradation, degradation in functionality. So um, the proving overhead is important and uh, we need better snarks or better reductions or better protocols to reduce it. And... Uh, so it won't take a long time to do the blockchain. Sorry? Oh, okay. You, you're asking about the proof of work. You're saying that uh, handling the blockchain requires tremendous effort anyway, so what's 10 minutes more? Or a minute more? For, but the point is it's done by different parties. The blockchain mining is done by 
dedicated, extremely powerful hashing engines in China. Whereas uh, the proving is something that you would do on your cell phone uh, when you're walking down the street. And uh, the last question is that of eliminating the trusted setup, um, foreshadowing the next discussion. In principle, it could be done using uh, a, a snarks based on PCP without pre-processing. Doing it practically with comparable or better parameters is an open problem. And the last one, uh, I'm not sure if it's an open problem or a solution to one, a deployment. And the good news is that this is actually uh, in, in, in the form of actual deployment. Uh, there's a commercial effort underway, uh, a building on top of uh, Live Zero Cash, um, and uh, we may see actually people relying on unfalsifiable assumptions in the near future. Um, there are many other applications of snarks for Bitcoin beyond Zero Cash. Um, for example, maybe summarizing properties of the blockchain to make claims about it, other than the ones that we mentioned. Um, uh, for those of you familiar with uh, Ethereum uh, or Hawk, um, there are attempts to um, add more power to the uh, Bitcoin scripting language to enable more sophisticated transactions. And the problem is that if you make it too powerful, everybody has to verify the transactions, they will incur cost. Ethereum is one system that does it, and they sort of make people pay for post putting in a hard to verify transactions. A hawk uh, developed by Elaine Shi and others is uh, um, is using uh, snarks, actually lip snark, to um, a, have just a single party do this computation and uh, produce a, a succinct proof that everybody can verify. So it solves that problem. It's a very amusing case of delegation of computation. And uh, actually, once we told people about zero cash, there was a flurry of activity in the Bitcoin forums and proposing all kinds of crazy things there that can be done with snarks, or at least sufficiently efficient snarks. Um, so I expect more to come in this uh, arena, precisely because, and going back to the beginning of our discussion, because it exercises all the right degrees of freedom. And it's um, in the one case uh, that we can very convincingly benefit from snarks despite their large proving overhead. We have statements that are small, but crucial to verify, and um, <coughs> we cannot use the trivial solution of publishing the weakness. We have to use zero knowledge to, to do all of these. Um, zero knowledge snarks are the only technology in town. So um, let's do the following. Uh, we will take a short break now, and now move to a succinct discussion of uh, the of snarks with the out preprocessing. Okay, let's uh, let's start. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a technical problem here. Uh, but I'm using uh, an old slide set, uh, and hopefully we'll switch to a new one in the middle. So there will be uh, some st strange uh, transitions in the middle, but uh, time is short, so let's make the best of it. Um, any questions on the previous subsession? So our next discussion is about uh, snark without preprocessing, and uh, by now we understand the uh, trouble with preprocessing. Uh, we've seen it um, we, in um, zero cash very clearly. There are a matter of uh, cost and of uh, trust, um, and we would like to eliminate it completely, ideally. Um, now the problem is that um, the most um, uh, the only known approach to getting snark without any preprocessing are those based on the Kilian Mikali um, is construction that we discussed previously. Those rely on full blown PCPs that are much less efficient than the current best snarks, which unfortunately are preprocessing snarks. But we can do much better even with preprocessing snarks. And let me tell you about um, a, a, how to construct these, and in particular describe an, an implementation. Uh, by Skipper Lab, um, building on prior works that provides the theoretical foundation for it. So, um, it, what we show is that um, as under a mild assumption of CRH, we can take any preprocessing snark 
and convert it into a scalable SNARK, where the difference between the two is uh, that, whereas in a preprocessing SNARK, the um, um, a, a, a prover, sorry, the generator has to work as hard as uh, the original computation. The, the, in the scalable SNARK, the prover um, is a, has a small size, depending uh, essentially on the security parameter and uh, some logarithmic number values. And um, moreover, the memory consumption of the prover is also kept at bay and becomes um, <laughs> essentially uh, quasi-linear in that of the original program, uh, regardless of the running time. There is no more blow up in uh, the memory consumption as a function of the running time. Um, but otherwise, we're no longer building uh, one huge R1 CS. This builds on the theoretical transformation of uh, Valiant and of uh, Alessandro and myself. And the main technique here is recursive proof composition, uh, popularly known in the FHG world as bootstrapping. So those were theoretical works that showed the, um, a, a, that the feasibility in principle. Um, note that, um, don't, no, we're short on time. So what we show is that uh, we can uh, actually achieve scalable SNARKs. Um, and we do that by actually achieving a recursive composition of proofs. And for that, we need some cool uh, new techniques in the realm of elliptic curves. So what does this transformation look like? Um, and let's do uh, a somewhat easier version using an automaton instead of uh, a whole RAM machine or Turing machine. So what we'll do is uh, a verify each step of the automaton separately and, uh, and maintain the invariant that um, at every step the, com the current computation is correct and moreover the following steps were correct by virtue of a snark proof that we checked. So we recursively um, uh, rely on the correctness of previous proofs so we have an automaton starting with some state, and uh, there's, we prove that it evolved correctly using a snark. And then the next step, we do the next transition, and uh, then we prove that, so we check the, the previous input using the snark verifier. And then we prove that we did both, it summarizes into a new snark proof, and so on recursively. And it seems that this should work. Right. If in the snark were completely sound, perfectly sound, then you could compose this way, and trivially the recursion would hold. The problem is that uh, uh, actually the soundness isn't um, perfect. It's only computational. This requires very careful analysis in terms of the underlying knowledge of exponent assumptions. Basically, we need to create um, a, prover, a knowledge extractor that uh, goes back and uh, verifies things, and this requires some careful analysis, very careful analysis. Um, then once we believe this, then we can extend this to a general RAM machine by taking care of the memory. And uh, carrying uh, the execution state, one way to do it is to use the uh, online memory checking uh, and carry just the Merkle root between the steps so the, and the, the actual content of the memory will not be part of the messages and the things done uh, handled in full by the, uh, the R1CS and therefore prover and verifier. Rather, it will reside within the uh, runtime that executes the, the prover, but only be talked about by the snark in the form of witnesses that contain authentication paths uh, for the memory accesses that actually happen at every individual step. Now, that's the theory, but there is an efficient, eff efficiency problem. Because we now are going to build a, a one cs a statement for the SNARK to prove, um, or circuit sets uh, almost equivalently. And um, we need to create a statement that contains the verifier for a proof produced by the prover from the previous step for the same statement. 
So there's no paradox here. It's okay. You can do that if you properly analyze it. But there is a, the, the question about uh, parameters. And asymptotically, we, asymptotically we're fine. Um, because the snark compresses uh, down to uh, constant proof size and polylogarithmic <coughs> verifier, with for sufficiently large parameters, this will converge. But not in practice, because the moment you do it for the first time, you find that this creates a huge verifier. The, um, a, 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 just expressing the verifier as an R1CS uh, creates a huge system of constraints. And anything you do from that on will have to deal with it. You can't win, uh, even on the first recomposition step. And a big cause for this uh, is that of a um, characteristic mismatch, a problem in the underlying implementation of the SNARKs uh, that comes from the algebraic structures that we use. Let me briefly describe it. All the known uh, snark constructions, that, uh, that, is, that is those that rely on the um, GGPR style preprocessing snarks, rely on pairings. And um, each pairing uh, works on a particular elliptic curve. And uh, the, the elliptic curve has two parameters. There's the field it's working on, and there is the order or more, more precisely, the characteristic of the field it's working on in our case. And the, the, the group order of the elliptic curve. And this comes into the picture in different ways. The uh, circuit set that we express, uh, or that one CS, leaves over the finite field um, with, uh, with characteristic uh, the same as the order of the curve. That's because it will end up living in the exponent of the, um, in the, of the, the base field uh, because of the pairings we use to, uh, to encrypt and check the queries to the linear interactive program. That's breaking a lot of abstractions here. But the actual verification uh, needs to get values that it receives, um, which are field elements in the underlying field. And expressing computation in one field, uh, when it talks about a different field, that's, uh, that's annoying. That's, uh, uh, doing this um, by uh, uh, just writing down uh, every number in the, in the QRE representation when the original numbers are uh, over R, that's of course possible, but it creates a logarithmic overhead. Um, we can't, unfortunately, choose the numbers to be the same and, and avoid the problem. And therefore, we have to do some new tricks, um, which are finding suitable cycles of elliptic curves. Meaning, um, if we can't have uh, one uh, verifier check things in its native characteristic field, maybe we can find two different fields that will allow us to go back and forth so that one verifier works on the character, it works on inputs uh, from uh, FR using FQ arithmetic, uh, and the other one uh, vice versa, so that everyone uh, can uh, can do the math natively. And um, it turns out that this is actually possible. Um, it's uh, a big surprise. It's not a priori clear that it's possible. And um, uh, there are theorems that show that such pairs exist, and there's a huge computational effort that we made, whoop, consisting of about 200 co years, to actually find such curves. And once we did it, here, here they are, you can save those 200 years of, uh, of co computation. Once we did this, we can tailor the whole system um, uh, to this application, including building the R1CS and finding the uh, a good implementation of the elliptic curves as R1CS and so forth. And we end up with an actual working system, in particular taking 32-bit tiny run, running computation of length t. Here are the concrete parameters of our prototype um, for two works. The, uh, the scalable SNARK uh, that from, uh, from, the pre from my previous session and this one. Sorry, the, the uh, universal SNARK from my previous session versus this one, the scalable. So as you can see, the key size is now essentially constant. I'm fixing security parameters and such. 
So the key size is constant 55 megabytes as opposed to 0 0.4 megabytes times the number of steps. And likewise, the length of the, of the, of the generator. It's oblivious to how long the eventual computation will run. <coughs> the prover now runs much, much slower, about 20 to 6 seconds per cycle on a typical desktop, uh, 10 seconds with some optimizations and the better machine. That's as opposed to 50 milliseconds uh, for a comparable computation without the bootstrapping. So it's much slower, but note the memory consumption. It's now fixed at about a gigabyte, as opposed to many or to several megabytes per step. Uh, okay, with parallel implementation, it's uh, 10 seconds. So we have a, a, a machine, a fully verified machine that can run anything without blowing up memory and with, the, with just linear overhead in performance, and you can trust it. It's wonderful. It's the holy grail. Uh, in many respects. Performance is not one of them. It runs not at a gigahertz, not at a megahertz. It runs at a decihertz, one tenth of a hertz. But the good news is that it's well-defined. There was no prior construction that actually had a well-defined hertz rating for verified computation. It required bootstrapping to do this. Um, so we would, we would love to know about other cycles. You would love to uh, improve the clock rate better than uh, decihertz. Let's break the one hertz barrier. That'd be nice. <laughs> and uh, whether better snark constructions can do better. Uh, well, oh, damn. OK, so one of the things that unfortunately dropped from my slides because of a technical problem is a discussion of another system called uh, Geppetto um, and building up on uh, Pinocchio. And uh, Geppetto is uh, another take on bootstrapping. It, um, it relies on the same idea of recursive composition, but uh, tailored by using the different techniques, using the Cox pinch um, method for taking a curve and extending it to another curve with the, uh, the right properties for efficient composition. And you can do it as long as you want to create a chain of characteristically matched verifiers, catches that there's an exponential blow up in the parameters. So the, uh, they only do it once, which allows them to pick uh, a somewhat faster, better curve for the basic computation. And you say, OK, well, why is it useful for doing it just once? And actually, they have a very nice system that exploits this power um, by taking the ASIC approach of all things, going back to the ASIC approach, and uh, then solving some of its problems by breaking the computation into chunks instead of treating it monolithically. Each chunk would be maybe uh, just part of the program to keep memory consumption down, or maybe an iteration of a loop or an if statement. And then f you, can, um, uh, you can tightly convert each chunk into R1CS, create a snark proof for it, and then aggregate all of these proofs instead of just sending them by um, uh, doing one layer of recursion on top to get things back down to a small size, and uh, that, that works for suitable programs um, with that approach. The one last thing um, is uh, revisiting um, PCP-based SNARKs as, the, uh, as our one and only uh, known construction that does not have any pre-processing and no, uh, in particular, private randomness that could break soundness. And uh, we have a multi-year effort uh, in the same Skipper lab um, in collaboration with a large team at the Technion, led by Professor Eli Ben Sasson and uh, with Alessandro Chiesa here and others, um, uh, where we actually implement these. And uh, in the lab right now, we have uh, a full implementation of a full PCP. Uh, you know, it may sound trivial, but actually it's the only one that I'm aware of that was actually coded and evaluated and optimized. Um, and uh, we have a snark on top of it for TigerM. The parameters right now are, a, are, are still very restrictive, uh, but um, we can, uh, within a few days, run computations up to uh, thousands of steps for uh, simple programs. So um, it, pass, it, it passes or will soon pass the fast enough for the submission deadline threshold, which is the first step. So um, keep posted on this one. And uh, I hope that inspired by these challenges, we will soon have some more breakthroughs. Thank you, and see you soon in the excursion.